Hi all and welcome back for lecture 3 of module 6 on participatory GIS. In this lecture, we will introduce the participatory GIS, a participatory approach to spatial planning and spatial information and communication management. PGIS combines participatory learning and action PLA, methods with geographic information systems GIS, in order to give an a sample of the methodologies and uses of PGIS we will do a short excursus of historical development of community mapping and show the experience of the Ar Argentinian group Iconoclasistas who created map community mapping laboratories in their country. To conclude, we will briefly show another use of PGIS, that is the participatory monitoring, bringing the example of how this methodology can be used to address social environmental conflicts resolution. The advent of geographic information technologies changed the public who had access to the map and the power relations between who is doing the map and who is looking at it. Those changes affected both the institutional and the political way of describing and building the territory and to relate with citizenship. On the political side, as affirmed by Elizabeth A. O.G. in her publication Effects of Globalization on Sovereignty of States, the globalized world changed the role of the states who lost power being no more the most important political actor. And at the same time, it facilitated the raising of a new conception of citizenship that is no longer strictly linked to the national belonging. This process led to the creation of new forms of political participation, this new way of living the citizenship and the changing of the perception of national belonging has been expressed by a more direct and shared way of doing politics, leaving the way to different experiences of territorial planning. Those experiences foster the creation of new approaches of civic decision-making. In this context, digital cartography is becoming a fundamental part of participative governance, representing a new tool to foster communication among various actor, public, private, and civic society. On the institutional side, the digital mapping marked an important changing in the communication between institutions and citizenship. Maps as instrument of communication and power can be used for propaganda purposes and to create consensus. Digital cartography produces changes in the way in which local administration relates to the territory. Indeed, most of the local administrators use digital cartography as an essential instrument to face the complexity of today's society. As well as the traditional cartography, also digital mapping has been criticized of creating a partial representation of the reality rather than simply describing it. Cartography is no longer the sole prerogative of governments and elites. Also, Peluso, in one of its publications in Antipod, correctly notes that in the real world, mapping is unlikely to become a science of the masses because of the level of investment required by the kind of mapping with the potential to challenge the authority of other maps. John Brian Arley, one of the most important pioneers in investigating cartography disconstruction in the sense of breaking the assumed link between reality and representation, which has dominated cartographic thinking in history, investigated alternative ways of understanding maps and its communication objectives, undertaking a deeper reflection on cartography's history. Among the several publications, he was co-editor of the History of Cartography, in which he gathered meanings, events, and results of cartography contribution in the bigger history of social movements. Starting from the deconstruction con that Derrida made of the literary text, Harley tried to demonstrate that the idea of a progress in cartography's ability to represent reality is a myth. There is no cartography able to represent reality. It is too complex to be represented in a map, and a two-dimensional product cannot explain that complexity. Second, 
the social impact of cartography and maps and their power in representing and consolidating a specific vision of the world. Third, the recognition of cartography as an interdisciplinary science as the rules to create maps are socially and historic historically constructed. According to Harley, the map is the language and the symbology of maps as well as the elements that are represented on the map are culturally defined. During the 90s, the academics start to focus their attention on the cartographic systems that enhance and strengthen the role of local communities and their interests, recognizing them as proper stakeholders. This system differ in technology used and in the level of participation and are First, participative cartography, made by communities following on external requests. Second, community-integrated GIS. And third, public participation GIS. The advent of geographic information technologies changed the public who had access to the map and the power relations between who is doing the map and who is looking at it. Those changes affected both the institutional and the political way of describing and building the territory and to relate with citizenship. The mapping of indigenous lands to secure its property, manage natural resources and strengthen cultures is a recent phenomenon. Having begun in Canada and Alaska in the 1960s, it spread in other regions, Africa, Asia, Latin America, during the last decade and a half. The power of traditional cartography contributed in the history to modify the relation between indigenous communities and the territory. It showed the economic interest in a territory without considering the previous relationships with the community living there. Maps have been used to control and colonize territories, as much as guns and warships, observes Harley in one of his more frequently quoted statements, maps have been the weapons of imperialism. The participative GIS is the instrument through which local communities can retake the power of creating a representation of their territory, especially to claim the fundamental right to the land and its use as a form of pacific resistance to the power of authorities. In this case, mapping become an act of territorial resistance. In the publication Mapping Indigenous Lands, Chapin and its co-authors explained that during the 20th centuries, as soon as the indigenous claims for the right to land became popular, there have been political, media, and in certain occasions physical conflict caused by the gap between governmental economic policies, as well as infrastructural projects promoted by the state, and the vision and use of the land that local communities historically had. A variety of metho methodologies have made their appearance, ranging from highly participatory approaches involving village sketches maps to more technical efforts with geographic information systems and remote sensing. In general, indigenous mapping has shown itself to be a powerful tool and it has spread rapidly throughout the world. Analyzing the spreading of indigenous concern in different parts of the world will show some examples of participative maps projects and the different experiences it brought. The growth of GIS laboratories among tribes in the United States and Canada, who frequently have both financial and technical support, is in sharp contrast to groups in the South, primarily Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where resources are in short supply and permanent GIS facilities are rare. Chapin and his co-author Analyzing Canada and Alaska experiences affirmed that indigenous mapping has been done almost entirely with hunting, gathering, fishing, trading, trapping groups. There were components of larger studies documenting land use and occupancy for the purpose of negotiating Aboriginal rights.
Chapin and his co-author, analyzing Canada and Alaska experiences, affirmed that indigenous mapping has been done almost entirely with hunting, gathering, fishing, trading, trapping groups. They were components of larger studies documenting land use and occupancy for the purpose of negotiating Aboriginal rights. According to Chapin and his co-author, the first indigenous mapping project appears in Canada and Alaska in the 50s and the 60s and become a standard approach to First Nations land claims during the 1970s. They were designed to counter prejudices that were gaining strength during the later part of the 19th century when the white colonists with backing from the Canadian government, began moving with ever increasing frequency into territory occupied by the native population. During this period, as cited from Chapin, the white majority held the belief that because the native population did not practice agriculture, they were not using the land. This explains why the target group for the Canadian experience of indigenous mapping were mostly hunting, gathering, fishing, trapping groups. An example of project is the first Nation Seeker project that was developed by Brian A. Strom. It is a comprehensive list of indigenous groups organized linguistically and supported by a detailed maps showing all the various indigenous groups and for each particular nation based on traditional indigenous knowledge. As explained by Chaplin and its co-author, in the 60s, indigenous population began to react against persistent attempts by the government to assimilate indigenous into the general Canadian population and impose a number of mega projects on their land, such as the James Bay Hydroelectric Project in Quebec and the Mackenzie Valley Gas Pipeline proposal in the Northwest Territories. Negotiation and struggle brought about more favorable policies, but advancement has been difficult. During the 70s, indigenous carried on the opposition movements against the government project, proposing different destinations for the lands made on community self-determination and their ancestral use of the territory. In this occasion, the Canadian government started to a study about indigenous lands legitimating <coughs> the legitimacy of unextinguished Aboriginal rights to land. A similar scenario was developing at the same time in Alaska with the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in 1971. As documented in the Elana's and co-author publication Subsistence Mapping and Evaluation and Methodological Guideline, in Alaska during the, seven, the 50s were made studies trying to understand the relationship between indigenous communities and territories. The most relevant study developed by Sunfield in the 50s in the Inupiat region of the North Slope Borough was the first notable application of mapping methodologies to issue of public policy, specifically conflicting land and resource use, as affirmed by B. Leron in the traditional land use and occupancy study, the methodology of the map biography, which charts the subsistence regime of individuals partially through time, grew out of these experiences and was refined in the 1970s with the Inuit Land Use and Occupancy Project published in 1976 by Milton Freeman, Professor in Cultural Anthropology at the University of Alberta. During the 60s, the US Energy Commission proposed the Project Chariot, a plan to use nuclear devices to excavate a deep water artificial harbor at Cape Thompson approximately 32 miles from Point Hope, the oldest Inuit settlement inhabited for 2,000 years, by burying and detonating a string of nuclear devices. Some of the first political action taken by the Inuit was an imposition to this experiment. As a result, the plan, Project Chariot, was called off. The study undertaken on the economic impacts of nuclear fallout for nuclear experiments on the indigenous communities of Point Hope, Nohotak and Kivilina became the model for numerous land occupancy studies and was published as the Inuit Land Use and Occupancy Project Report. Covering 33 communities in the Northwest Alaska, the project documented past and present hunting, fishing, trapping and gallery patterns by viewing them through the eyes of the Inuit.
it recording Inuit perception of their relationship to the land, compiling extensive data on history, place names, linguistics, subsistence techniques, campsites, and other cultural information. 20 years later, Herscher, in his publication Reclaiming the Land, Aboriginal titled Treaty Rights and Land Claim in Canada, affirmed that the map biography has become virtually the sole methods of documentation in the official claims process. Chapin's study also introduces the evolution of indigenous mapping in other regions of the world as Asia, Africa and Latin America, where mapping has dealt with mixed hunting, fishing and agricultural societies and different issues than those of Canada and Alaska. Mapping with tribal and ethnic groups in Southeast Asia, Africa and Latin America only began in the early 90s. And the primary purpose, as in Canada and Alaska, was to produce documentation for land claims and secondly for natural resources management. Matsurek is the project report mapping on the Oyapoke indigenous territories while describing the content the context of the use of participatory methodologies in Latin America mapping experiences, it says that the main purposes of participatory mapping was documenting the indigenous population presence and activities in territories that on the official maps seems to be empty spaces and free to be used for resource exploitation projects. Therefore, it was important to document local history and describe the geographical transmission patterns of traditional ecological knowledge. Chapin also affirms that with the exception of the work in Canada and Alaska, much of the literature on indigenous mapping deals with the convergence of participatory methodologies and GIS. In the late 80s, development practitioners introduced participatory rural appraisal, PRA, and participatory action research, PAR, and sketch mapping with little or no input from professional cartographers. The involvement of communities in the mapping process can be done following different approaches. Chambers defines participatory rural appraisal, PRA, as a growing family of approaches and methods used to enable local people to share, enhance and analyze their knowledge of life and conditions, to plan and to act. It consists in involving local stakeholders in a process of data collection developed starting from the opinions and the views of local communities. Kingdon and co-authors defines participatory action research, PRR, as the umbrella term covering a variety of participatory approaches to action-oriented research. It is an approach to research in communities that emphasizes participation and action. PRR emphasizes collective inquiry and experimentation grounded in experience and social history. Chapin affirms that the primary purpose of this mapping was to elicit local knowledge and facilitate discussion with communities, rather than linking villages to government policy makers. Participation was seen as important in building local capacity, empowering communities, facilitating communication, breaking down power structures and fostering democratic institutions. These approaches were a low technology, but of limited utility. For example, it was useful to raise awareness on communities about land rights and occupancy issues, but the result could not be used for land tenure and legal battles with the state. Synergy between PRA approaches and the technology of GIS allowed the combination of scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge and could be used as a tool to strengthen community claims toward institution, as affirmed by Bata Sharia in her publication Using Participatory GIS to Bridge Knowledge Devices. Divides. In order to understand better the methodology and what to produce a collective man means, we will present the experience of a group of young web designers and sociologists from Argentina that worked with participative GIS and collective mapping, called Iconoclasistas. Iconoclasistas are the authors of the publication Manual of Collective Mapping, a collection critical cartographic resources for territorial purpose processes of collaborative creation, in which they explain their participatory mapping laboratory's methodology.
Iconoclastistas is a duo composed by Pablo Ares and Julia Riesler, and the products are published on the web through Creative Commons License, promoting free use and circulation. At the beginning of their experience in 2006, the aim of Iconoclastistas was to generate visual devices communicating landscapes of injustice and inequality. In this way, tools for comprehension were created and reflexive conscience as well as critical knowledge emerged when planning transformational actions and organization and resistant practices. In 2008, the methodology of mapping workshops was experimented and adopted. From that moment on, fostering collaborative work became the center of their work by using graphic resources to help giving visibility to the most pressing issues of particular territories. We will now review together some extracts from the manual. Referring to Korzybski's assumption that maps are not the territory, Iconoclasistas affirms that maps are static images that cannot capture the constant changes to which territories are exposed. Maps do not contemplate the subjectivity of the territorial processes, their symbolic representations, nor the imaginaries about them. The people who inhabit the territory are the ones who can really create and transform them. They shape them every day by inhabiting them, going through them, perceiving and creating them. Mapping is a tool providing a snapshot of the moment in which it, has, it was taken. Yet it does not recover completely a territorial reality which is always problematic and complex. Drawing collective maps transmits a specific notion on a dynamic and constantly changing territory where borders, both real and symbolic, are continually altered and exceeded by the actions of bodies and subjectivities. For Iconoclasistas, collective mapping is, and we quote, a creation process subverting the place of initiations to challenge dominant narratives on territories. To do so, they recur to everyday knowledge and experiences of participants. They underline the responsibilities reflecting upon the links to other topics and marking consequences. This viewpoint goes along with the process of remembering and marking experiences in areas of organization and transformation, so as to create a network of solidarity and affection. While the hegemonic representation might become the starting point for workshops, when using, for example, a printed cadastral map, with its pre-designed borders, during the process of exchange of knowledge, a critical look over the territory is built as a result of the various opinions and thoughts shared. Therefore, the first representation is transformed due to the fact that hidden questions are those which are not simple to represent, are not included. If there is time during the workshops, map can be drawn freehand. This becomes an opportunity to play with borders, senses and shapes. In each case, we must keep in mind that maps are only one tool among many others. Drawing maps is part of an organizational and collective process. This activity promotes the diagnosis and drawing up of participatory projects expected to be developed through the time. John Brian Arley, one of the most important pioneers in investigating cartography disconstruction in the sense of breaking the assumed link between reality and representation, which has dominated cartographic thinking in history, investigated alternative ways of understanding maps and its communication objectives, undertaking a deeper reflection on cartography's history. Among the several publications, he was co-editor of the History of Cartography, in which he gathered meanings, events and results of cartography contribution in the bigger history of social movements. Starting from the deconstruction that Derrida made of the literary text, Harley tried to demonstrate that the idea of a progress in cartography's ability to represent reality is a myth. There is no cartography able to represent reality. It is too complex to be represented in a map, and a two-dimensional product cannot explain that complexity. Second, the social impact of cartography and maps and their power in representing and consolidating a specific vision of the world. Third, the recognition of cartography as an interdisciplinary science, as the rules to create maps are socially and historically constructed. 
According to Harley, the map is the language and the symbology of maps as well as the elements that are represented on the map are culturally defined. Creative maps always come out of Iconoclasista's workshop and it results of many views of the territory. The work most of the time is not more a digital work but to take shape of an artistic opera. They believe that the design and production, we quote, of all these tools of free circulation were reappropriated and employed, illustrate the critical and political potential of graphic and artistic devices, a free toolbox to promote creative activism embedded in the territory. And you can read more about this on page 40 of the mapping manual. Before analyzing the use of GIS in participatory monitoring, we will give a short definition of what is meant by participatory monitoring and evaluation. Quoting from the definition of Dillon, participatory monitoring and evaluation is a process through which stakeholders at various levels engage in monitoring or evaluating a particular project, program or policy, share control over the content, the process and the results of the monitoring and evaluation activity and engage in taking or identifying corrective actions. Participatory monitoring and evaluation focuses on the active engage engagement of primary stakeholders. In participatory monitoring and evaluation processes, the stakeholder groups are involved in a participatory monitoring activity that include the end users of the project goods and services, women as well as men at the community level, intermediary organizations, NGO representatives, private sector businesses involved in the project and government staff at all levels. According to Dillian, the core principles of participatory monitoring and evaluation are local people to be active participants and not just sources of information. Stakeholder have to have a real evaluation role and the outsiders simply facilitate the process. The focus is on stakeholder capacity building for analysis and problem solving and the process builds commitments of all parties to implement any recommended corrective actions. Quoting McCracken and Parker definition, the participatory approach to monitor and evaluation will usually make use of a number of techniques and tools selected and combined to suit the objective of the monitoring and evaluation work and the resources available. Many of the techniques associated with participatory rural appraisal, PRA, beneficiary assessment, BA, and SARAR have been used in the context of monitoring evaluation. By SARAR, which means self-esteem, associative strength, resourcefulness, action planning and responsibilities, we intend interactive and visual-based methods used to facilitate community discussion with us pocket charts, triple sorting and story with a gap. By beneficiary assessment, we imply the use of converse, conversational interviewing and focus group discussion on changes and impacts on the beneficiaries. Something that interests a lot uh, our organization as soon has to do with environmental participatory monitoring. So the application of environment of monitoring, GIS monitoring, to environmental monitoring of in particular contaminated sites. Uh, for us this represents a huge opportunity to collect independent data from the normal uh, monitoring that is uh, done on contaminated sites and to scientifically prove its efficiency. So that on what side activates uh, citizens to be active in the gathering environmental information and on the other hand it supports the struggle of the local community to prove actual contamination when the usual monitoring system uh, lake 
let's say, uh, enough work or capacity or will to be able to demonstrate uh, the real impact of the, the real dimension of the contamination of a given territory.